Welcome back to another episode of The Hit Podcast. My name is James Layton, CEO and founder of Anderson James. This is the podcast where I bring you real life stories from some of the most inspirational leaders of our sector. Today, I was delighted to be joined by Peter Jackson, Managing Director at Seddon Construction. We talk at length about Peter's journey at Seddon, having joined there as a QS in 1994. Seddon recently celebrated their 125 years in business, and we talk about all of the challenges and the successes that you can get from running a family business. I think you'll get lots of value from this episode, and if you do, I'd ask that you like and subscribe. Peter, welcome to the podcast. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's really good of you, James. No worries. Uh, as I always like to start, um, I've done you a brief introduction before the episode, but just give us a bit of an overview of yourself, who you are, what you do um, for, for the benefit of the listeners. Yeah, so my name's Peter Jackson. I'm a dad. I've got three children, all in the house today, so I hope they're not noisy in the background. And I've got a dog here, Bailey, who's trying to desperately get my attention and get a chewy stick. Um, I like walking. I love being outside. I love a clear night sky and astronomy. And there's a group, good book called A Brickmire's Guide to the Galaxy, which I recommend to people. I really like reading. And for my sins, I'm a Manchester United fan. Wow. <laughs> I'm a Burnley fan, mate. So we went down last year, so it's not in, it's not relevant <laughs> anymore. <laughs> but perfect. And, and like managing director of Seddon, um, give us an overview, a helicopter view of Seddon as it stands today and, and your role within Seddon. Yes, yeah, so, so I work for Seddon Construction and the managing director of that business. It's uh, 165 million pound turnover there or thereabouts. Um, 500 employees, 250 of those are trades, um, bricklayers, joiners, plasterers, painters, um, electricians, plumbers, candlestick makers, most of all, all the trades there. Um, and we operate in the Northwest and Midlands where we're painters, house builders, maintenance contractors. We do mechanical electrical installs, um, your retrofit type of things as well. And um, we're constructor of shiny things, schools, hospitals, care homes, warehousing. That kind of thing. And what does your, there's quite a lot, and I know Seddon really well, but for the listeners, like that's quite a diverse portfolio that Seddon undertake. What does your role look like in that? So what's the sort of structure that that, that, that reports into you? So yeah, we, we, we kind of stream the business into um, operating divisions. So we have a housing partnership business, we have a director who runs that for us. We have a painting business, um, we have a mechanical electrical business, which we're totally repurposing now into retrofit. They used to do installations on building sites, but there's lots of people who want to do that. And there's going to be a skill shortage for the retrofit market. So we're to retrain our people there. And then we have a property services business, which is your maintenance and your refurb, extend, your small works kind of thing. And, um, and and then we have a, a team that do larger projects and they're basically an owner type leader for each business and a director in most cases that report into me. Yeah. And then the usual things around Sheck, HR, IT, um, what else goes on? Yeah, the, the FD, <laughs> plant, fleet. It's a big entity, really. It is a big entity, that. yeah. And, yeah. and take me back then. So you, you went to uni as a, to, to do your QS degree. Yeah. What 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 got you into the industry? I'm always interested to understand what was the motivation for you and why did you choose the, the route you did? Well, I don't know if I chose it. My dad started off as an apprentice joiner and he worked for a furniture business and he did his claim to fame is he put the wardrobes into Georgie Best's house in the 60s. <laughs> really? so, so we went into that and the company he worked for went bump and he, he, he joined um, British Oxygen and worked his way through there for the rest of his career. So he left the industry. And then I did the exact opposite. I did my A-levels in physics, chemistry, and maths, and then um, got a sponsorship of British Oxygen to go to Reading University to do chemistry and didn't last to Christmas. I just got a big wad of money and enjoyed myself for 10 weeks. And then when I came back, I had to find the job. So I was interviewing for jobs and there was a job for a building surveyor that I went for that turned out to be a quantity surveyor. And I just thought, you know what? I'll have a go at this. Yeah. And then I worked for, it was Fairclough Building in Swinton at the time, and they did a part-time degree at Salford University. Um, so I did that for five years. So then I started at Fairclough's in Swinton, and they sent me to um, to university at Salford to do my degree part-time. 
Yeah. And at that point, I was in a band and I thought that's what the future is going to be. It was the Manchester scene and everything like that. Yeah. And I played guitar terribly, but I had a van, so I could stay in the band because I could cut all the stuff around. Yeah. And then um, really found my feet in my job. When I left, when I got my degree, I left and I joined Seven in 1994. And it became a little bit more exciting because you was doing your own, running your own jobs, doing your own thing, not part of a massive team and yeah. responsible for stuff. And, and that's when you start to take more... I think more, not more pride, but more of a, a a challenge in what you're doing and enjoying it and you're seeing you're achieving things. And that, that was the thing for me at that point. Yeah. And what was, what did Seddon look like in 1994? <laughs> what was the size of the business then? Was it the same sort of scale and size or is it, is it developed a lot since then? There's been a lot, there's been a lot of changes to be fair. And the business that I, I joined was called G&J Seddon right. and it was run by Christopher. Uh, it was Christopher Seddon's business, in essence, although it was part of a wider Seddon group. I think it was about 35, 40 million pound turnover. Right. And most of the work was either tendered through the letterbox because it was well established and everybody priced everything at that time. Or Christopher brought work in himself for his customers and through his own landlord and development things, care homes, a lot right. of work that way. Um, and it was a it was it was kind of fascinating that he knew everybody's name and he knew the wife's name and the children's name and everything about anything we'd ever built and he used to read all the post so when emails came out he used to take <laughs> the emails home and read them as well yeah. but it was it was it was something that you know he run completely and it was um it was fabulous to see but yeah. change you know growth the world changes the way we work changes and we're a different entity now yeah exactly and I mean, Seddon are etched into the Northwest history, aren't they, as, as one of the longest standing businesses. And I saw recently that you're celebrating 125 years in business, which ah, I think we're talking off air. There's not many eclipsed that in the time I've been around. Um, what, what's, why has that been? And I, I suppose it's been a very proud moment for the Seddon family, but kind of how have you celebrated? What's it meant to everyone? And, and why do you think, I suppose, <laughs> they've got to this point <laughs> when others haven't? Yeah, there's a lot, to, a lot there. Um, how they've celebrated is um, when there was the centenary year 25 years ago, they did a partnership with the Christie yeah. where they built a facility for them and the Christie paid them back when they could sell private treatment. So mm -hmm. they invested, I, I think it was might have been, it was quite a lot of money in terms of, building these facilities and kept that partnership going. So the target in the 125 years, the celebration is to raise a million pounds and we're 970,000 pounds in, I've just found wow. out from our uh, marketing person, Emma. So we're a good way there. And people have done lots of little challenges around 125. So Vanessa, Jonathan's BA swim 125 miles. I've walked 125 miles. I and, saw that. Yeah. yeah. We'll come back to that. <laughs> I, I lived through it. It was it was gonna be fun. But in the end, it was a war of attrition. The hottest day, I think, on the Friday when we finished. It was oh, brilliant. No. Where did you go from to? I, I was tracking this online, but where did you where did you start your journey? So we, we walked from Birmingham, where we've got our office back up to Manchester. So along the canal network. So we came up the canals. Ended up in Runcorn and I'm walking from Runcorn into Manchester. So right. did 25 miles a day for five days. And uh, I thought it was going to be easy and just a bit of a laugh, really. But the last day was just <laughs> incredibly I painful. <laughs> I bet I bet your feet were a mess after that. <laughs> it was my knees. My feet was bad, but my knees was just like, it took me a week to get on. <laughs> so we, we've celebrated in lots of ways. We've had a, a spring ball and we've, had, uh, we've got a family fun day at Manly Mere where the whole company's bringing the family. Mm -hmm. And um, and then you know you know in terms of um, why we've got 125 years, um, one thing that I keep on hearing a lot in the company I've heard ever since I started is taking a long term view and patient capital. And I think the family and the owners they're in the business. It's obviously a massive baton pass to Jonathan, um, Jamie, and Nicola, yeah. um, who, who are the shareholders now. But um, they take, they're about the business, so it's not about the short term. I did a bit of a, a thing recently where I said there's no Lamborghinis in the car park, and I regret saying that afterwards because 
you know, it, it, it sounded like, you know, we, we wasn't ambitious. And I think somebody said to us, you're not sexy, but we've avoided, we've avoided all the glamour work and we've done the stuff that we're good at. We've stuck to our knitting and people have gone into high rise and, and not kept wool on the back and kept profits in the business. Yeah. have gone now. Bit, there's a graveyard of family businesses. And of course, major contractors, Carillion's too big to fail by not leaving money in the business and keeping it going. And I think that's what they've done really, really well. Yeah, yeah. And there's a there's a definite, I've worked with them for a long time, there's a definite family feel in the culture of the employees, not, not just because the Sedham family that run the business, but there's just a different culture in the business, isn't there? Do you think that stems down from the family or is that just because of the longevity and the longevity of some careers that you've had there? I think the longevity is because of the family and the family's approach. I mean, that we've got four generations. We've got the fifth generation of the ownership working in the business now, but we've got four generations of other families that have worked in the business, you know, and through the trades and what have you. Yeah. And the length of service, we've got one of the directors has worked with us for over 40 years and things like that. So mm-hmm. it does engender stay in there. And it is, it does all come from um, the owners because they are people focused and take a genuine interest in things. So decisions, we can make a decision on the basis of a relationship or what's the right thing to do rather than just a return. Yeah. And I think people people see that and they see the investment we're making them in terms of training and and, uh, and the apprenticeship scheme. And, and we're doing a thing this year um, in terms of the apprentices, where we're going, where are they now? Because we've got, you know, people that started at 16 that are on the board, that have gone from being bricklayers to estimators, to design managers, to project managers, to planners. And we've got, it isn't, your career in construction isn't linear. You don't, you don't just stay on a straight line to be an apprentice bricklayer, to being a bricklayer, to being a foreman bricklayer, whatever it is. It can be yeah, anywhere yeah, in the company. And I think that creates... That level of opportunity creates genuine affection and loyalty to the company as well. Yeah, and, and you are a people first business in the sense of you know I work with some of your directors and you will always in, you know internally promote before you'll go external. So that's that, and that's the way to run a company. But I think what what's your view on us getting the next generation of talent into the market? I see a landscape at the moment where I think there's been a slowdown in graduates, trainees, people being interested in our marketplaces. But I do think that some of the long-standing businesses in the marketplace are still investing heavily. What more could we do to inspire the next generation? And what more can we do to, to keep the pedal to the metal in terms of making sure we're investing in younger people and, and apprentices, graduates, trainees in, in the markets we serve? Well, I... <laughs> Attraction doesn't seem to be the issue. We, no. we never, we, we don't generally go out and advertise that we're taking apprenticeships on. And when I'm saying apprentices, I'm going to talk about your, your degree students as well now, because you do that through the apprentice model. Yeah. But we don't usually go out and advertise, but we've, we was getting 500, 600 applications. And what we're doing now with the, with the people that we can't take on is we're feeding them into supply chain and saying, right. do you want these people as well? Because they're really, really good. We just haven't got capacity to take them all on because taking on recruiting at that level, you need good mentors and lots of mentors. And they, yeah. you, you can only take so many people on. We've got 50 or 60 apprentices, trainees at any one time. And you think to have that, you need to have 100 mentors. So it's yeah. difficult. And um, so, so we pass them on. For, for me, it's retention. And, and the retention of them is the most important thing. And we, the pandemic's totally changed the way that people think about life and what what they want from life and they want to work life balance more. Um, Working from home has been a big thing for us and we've allowed that and really encouraged that uh, and the pandemic pushed us on in terms of making making that progress because we had to get the technology right good. But then there was an unfairness with the guys and girls on the building sites because they're saying, why can't I work from home? And they're going, well, (laughs) can you build a wall in your back garden and bring it in? And that, and that sounds really patronising, So, but there's reality to that. So you think about what can you do to address their work-life balance? Um, and we've got to think about that. I, I, I'm, the, the key for me is productivity because 
you know, if you're getting five days where people are giving you six hours real effort and work, that's yeah. 30 hours in a week. If I can get four days at nine hours, that's 36. I've improved my productivity by 20%, and people yeah. have got a day off, an extra day to do things. Now, the, there's a cultural challenge there because, you know, yes. contracts, customers, being on time there's there's a lot of challenges around being on time right now with materials and getting the workforce but we've got we've got to start redesigning the industry and just how we work and and how we think about work life and how we think about productivity because i do think in the uk productivity has gone backwards agree uh, with the pandemic and brexit and everything else i agree and we're seeing from a talent perspective, you know, the number one thing used to be progression and money and, you know, you, you, you'd name the four or five things that people ask for, right? And and now number one has got to be flexibility. How is this going to work for me? Um, and, and probably number two is there's a lot around sustainability. You talked about retrofit, but there's a lot around the next generation of looking at how can we make our planet more green and how can we make things work? Um, but I do think that flexibility within our industry is difficult because, as you say, things happen physically on site. We can't change where they are, um, yeah. but how we manage them on productivity. Because you look at countries like Sweden and other countries that are doing four-day weeks, they're making it work somehow. So there's a big piece of work to do there. I think I think when we spoke to clients about it, they said, yeah, it's fine as long as you're on time. And then you go in, yeah, we get that. There's lots of reasons why we're not on time. So... Mm. It isn't is. just it isn't just straightforward issue, but we have to think about that. And and then we're just selling the roles and 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 the, the way your career can change. You know, technology means that my son who works is an IT programmer, software programmer for a bank. He could work anywhere in the world. Yeah, and design managers could do that. Um, you know. Um, how do we how do we sell to people that you might start as a trainee or apprentice bricklayer, but you might be a design manager, you might be a project manager, you might be managing director one day? Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. And how do we solve the problem of the the curve? So I think there's less patience now in the world around progression. People want progression quicker than they ever have before. Otherwise, they they look elsewhere. And obviously, I love with your career that you've been very loyal to Seren over the over that period. However, people seem to jump shit quicker these days to try and forward their career. But there used to be a 10-year learning period where people were a QS for 10 years and then they'd look at progression. It feels like that curve's got a lot steeper for people. How do we make sure that we fundamentally give leaders the right skill set before we promote them too early? <laughs> This this is this is a real a, a real challenge for us, isn't it? Because I'm trying to work out. I remember uh, meeting a, a, a project manager on a job a handover yeah. uh, about ten years ago, and I was I was met him on site, and that the, the matron who's going to run the care home gave him a big hug and a kiss, and said, "Well done, it's beautiful. Thanks for looking after me, and all this kind of stuff." And I said, "What's next for you?" And he said, "Contracts manager." I said, "Oh, I thought you meant next. I was meant next job. Where are you going next?" There's no one to be a contracts <laughs> manager next. And I said to him, "What happens when you meet your contracts manager on site?" He says, "What well, time all my problems?" I says, "And does he get flowers and a kiss at Andover?" He says, "No." He says, "So you want none of the glory, but all the responsibility <laughs> and problems?" Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And he went, "No." I said, "Do you really want more money?" And he went, "Yeah, probably." <laughs> So I think we need, really need to understand what that progression means and what it is. There used to be, the, I used to look at the car park and as, as a young surveyor with, with car envy and going, oh, what I really want is the best car. What I don't really want is all the stress in the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, exactly. so we've got to look at packages and, and understand really what people mean when they want to progress quickly. Um, there's a lot of, exp you know, one thing that you can't accelerate is experience and what we've gone through just recently with a pandemic um, means that, you know, even at my old age, we haven't gone through that before. So where do we call on that experience? How do we come overcome problems now? Do they get that? It's a period of time. Yeah. So one of the things we're bringing into Seddon right now is, is a mentoring and coaching structure for mm -hmm. young, young people coming through. I've mentored and coached three people, two into the change from manager to director and one from a job change from quantity surveyor to pre-construction manager. 
right. just to talk about the things that they'd never even thought about. So we just created a list of, of items and said, do you understand this? Do you understand that? Do you understand where you make the biggest impact in the process? Yeah. What do you think? And just talk through things and make them go away and do some work and, and research. And, and that stood them in good stead. I think we need to do more of that. What we've got to do is when we accelerate people's careers quickly is we we lose that experience gap. So we've got to somehow find a way of getting the experience from the older people, more experienced people into them. And yeah. that might prolong their careers as well. So yeah, yeah, I agree. There's, some, there's got to be some balance somewhere where we retain this industry knowledge. It will be very quickly lost. Yeah, we. I agree. And I think... We need to slow some careers down in order to give that that base layer of knowledge because sometimes, I mean, I've seen it throughout my career, I've been in the market 15 years, and the amount of people you see that have been over-promoted and it stunts their growth, if anything, because they've gone too quickly and then they've got to go back a step and your ego stops you from taking a step back to go and get the knowledge you need, to be honest. Um, definitely. But so, so as we just talk about your career, because like people will definitely ask me this, I'm sure, mm. QS to MD, I mean, there's a lot of, stuff that happens in between all of them things but what would you say the fundamental things that you did were that got you to the level that you got to so what did you think you did differently to other qs's that might still be in commercial management roles that got you to that managing director level i think you know i always did the thing that was missing in the team so if it was when we looked at the team, if somebody wasn't very good at, at, at managing the client or somebody wasn't very good at managing design and it wasn't in my responsibility to do that, I'd always take that initiative. I'd always take that extra responsibility and step in. Yeah. Because um, because what was always important to me was doing a good job and, um, and, and getting some repeat work as well. So for me, it was taking the initiative uh, making sure that we, we we got the job done. And the second thing was, was always do the difficult things. So if there was a problem job yeah. or there was a problem in the business, volunteer to go and fix it. Uh, the biggest break I got was, um, well, there was two really. When I, was, when I came to Seddon's in 94, I worked with a contracts manager, contracts director called Jack Davis, who really let me take more and more responsibility. It was great. Yeah. He was very, 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 very nurturing and supportive. And he'd always have your back. So you could take chances and you could, you could, you could, but chances don't mean chances and being doing daft. You could assume responsibility and take responsibility for things knowing he'd look after you. Yeah. And then when I went to Waits, there was a problem job that I looked after that that, that we, we, we made a success of. And there was a failing part of the business. And the managing director had um, said, you've done a great job here. Basically, you've got nothing to lose because it's on its bottom. Yeah. Why don't you go and see if you can fix that for me? So I ended up running a region for weights um, through a partnership that they had with um, up in the northeast and then other parts of other, other customers as well. Yeah. Um, it, I think it's about 30, something like that. So it was a change from commercial management into general management. And then being allowed to learn, and they supported that. Then they invested in Enley Management College, and um, the MD was a good mentor. He'd come up and he would spend some time with me in the evening, going yeah. through things and just chatting. And it, I think it's just about taking that initiative, really. Yeah, and 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 what do you think about like making mistakes? So I think the problem with our industry can be. Um, and, and I say a problem, there's loads of great things that happen in our industry, but one thing is, is that you have to make mistakes in leadership to learn your lessons and to, to shape your leadership style in the future. But as, as an MD, do you encourage people to take that, that step and to, to learn their own way? Because like, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of leaders out there that I would say, you know, don't want people to have the control and they don't allow them to, to make mistakes. And therefore we, we create leaders that only have like a one track skill set where they're good at one thing but they're not good at all the other things around it but what what kind of things do you do to encourage your guys to to develop themselves in Seddon? I think the biggest thing is about the di discussion and the debate yeah. and the advice and um, we call it uh, one of the directors we call it batting and balling where we're just knocking ideas about with each other mm -hmm. but they have the ultimate decision and um you know, you know, recruiting big positions and things like that. 
you, you, you go through a lot of due diligence in getting people into a role. You do, you do your, your, your psychometric testing, you interview yourself, you interview with others, you have a panel, you, you take references. You can still, you can still get that wrong. Yeah. Um, and they might not fit culturally. So to have somebody who's come through your business and understands your business and understands why you do things is massively important. And that makes giving responsibility easier because they know why you're doing something. So if you look at, if I compare Manchester United now to Ajax, because there is a tenuous link with our new manager, Manchester yeah. United appeared to be from the outside a dictatorship where somebody who didn't, who wasn't qualified to take all the decisions was taking them. Whereas in Ajax, everybody knows what's expected from, from every part of the business. Yeah. And they all play the same way. Each team plays the same way. And it's great, isn't it? So it's yeah. easier then when somebody comes through from one team to the next to the next, know exactly what's expected of them. Yeah, yeah, no, it's a good point in that. And I think you can make loads of football analogies, can't you, in terms of kind of the leadership lessons that we learn. But in, in terms of kind of, the things that were different for you? Because the one thing that some QSs or commercial staff will say is, is that the, the role of an MD is multifaceted. How did you upskill yourselves in the bits that <laughs> you didn't have? Like commercial, I'm sure, comes naturally to you because it's what you did your degree in, it's what you do all your things in. But but how did you manage the ops and the technical and the design and all the other bits that make up a, a more leadership role? You can't know everything yourself, so you have to find the people who do know. I think that's the key, isn't it? So yeah. when we, we didn't have design management in the company, it was done as part of the project team. With design management, we, it was just done through the project teams, but design became more and more, more, and more onerous. Building regs got more strenuous. You looked at you used to look at a building in components. You can't do that anymore. You've got to look at the whole building yeah. now in terms of performs, in terms of part L and other regulations. So we needed technical skill in that. And we we brought a chap in and yeah. um, we did a lot of due diligence around that. And we said, right, what does technical look like for setting in five years? And we developed a plan. And then it was really just keeping him to task on that and working together to, yeah. to understand this is where we're going. Have we got the right have got the right memberships, the right support, the right recruitment, the right number of resources? Is it yeah. improving? And it's just about finding the expert, really. Yeah, and, and I think that's important, isn't it? Complementary teams with different skills, they're important, aren't they, in this day and age in terms of you're not going to have all the answers. And I think people, when they go into leadership sometimes, can genuinely think they need to know every answer, and that's not the case, definitely not. No, it's um, really difficult. It's, it's really difficult that because you're going to be questioned on it, aren't you? You're going to be yeah. questioned on everything. So you feel at some point you do need to know the answer. But having the people who are there who do is the key, I think. Yeah, 100%. And, and, and on Seddon, because it's something that I always think about, really, but what what are some of the great things about working for a family business and what can some of the challenges be? Because Because naturally... I think about my business and all of my business partners and MDs in our business at the moment are all good friends of mine. And don't get me wrong, when it's going well, everything's brilliant. Yeah. But we fight like we're brother and sister at times as well. And, and you know, <laughs> it can have a bit more intensity to it. But what, what are some of the things you've observed over that period of time? I'm sure it's changed over the years, but that have been brilliant. And what are some of the things that you think, well, if you come into a family business, you need to be aware of this, this and this. And that's not just as a leader, but as an employee as well. I mean, the brilliant things are we, you know, we've got very, very good access to decision making, and we'll do yeah. things, we'll, we'll do things because they're right, the right thing to do, and we'll do things because we want to do them. So, you know, the, 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 uh, we invested in a waste transfer station because we could, because there was a problem in it, and it was the right. It was not a high margin business, but it's the right thing to to do yeah. in terms of diverting stuff from landfill it creates jobs it's a great partnership business so we can invest in things we can make decisions we set up the waste transfer business creates jobs diverts things from landfill it's not it's not high margin but it's 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 a good ethical business and and that's yeah. one of the things we can do we've done lots of things like that and um, we we can you know in terms of a family business it's kind of more intuitive because the things that you don't think are important are important. So you think as if you're looking after a, a company that's turned over 160 million pounds, um, sometimes the bonuses to the 
to, to the trades on site can be a big issue because somebody's not getting paid enough and now it's yeah, a big yeah, challenge yeah. he's worked here for 40 years yeah. and then a big issue can we just get on with it why are you talking to me about that just get on with it that's your job so there is this intuitive and in a family business if you're new to it if you don't know what's important then you can find it confusing i think yeah. but once you do know what's important it's kind of it's a safety there's a feeling of safety that comes from that because you know yeah. that people are there to look after people in the right yeah. way um, and, and it's about and, and the family business can be um about the the pound shillings and pence it can be about keeping costs tight because that's what family businesses are but then it can be massive investment in something as well or we're gonna we're gonna buy this piece of land to do something with this other customer and a jv and so yeah. it's kind of it, it's very very intuitive and once you once you understand it it's very reassuring yeah and I, I, the one thing I found in COVID, I mean, it was terrible for everyone and taking the health part out of the situation, if we just think of it from a business perspective, I realized quite quickly that whilst we can fight like cat and dog as, as MDs in my business, I realized quite quickly that there's a grit that you can't, you can't create in a corporate business because I've worked in both and, and actually like it, when there's a sign of trouble and I'm sure when the recession happened and all sorts must have happened in that 125 years there's an almost stand to arms of we're going to get through this because we've done it before and we're a family yeah Covid, what, what, COVID yeah. was that I think yeah Covid was that how was Covid for, 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 for you and as a person but also as a as a business, how, how did you how did you overcome that? How did you find that as a as a process? Because it was it was unknown, wasn't it? It was really unknown. I think there wasn't a cascade of leadership, neither was there, because we was watching the news on a late on a Sunday evening, and we was getting a message that we didn't really fully understand. And go to work if you can, stay at home if you can't, and uh, <laughs> yeah. just whatever it was he was saying just didn't make sense. So. As we was we was on the phone um, as as a board on Sunday evening or WhatsApp group going right. We need to we need to understand this. What will the staff think? So we we're sending things out to staff. We had to we had to get technology right very very quickly, and that was a massive stress for our IT department in terms of getting people all onto Yammer or Fire Text or something whatever, so we could communicate with people. Yeah. But the big the big concern for us was. We just didn't know we was going to have a business. So you sat there and you're turning over £16 million a month and you're employing all these people. And the families, aren't they? The subcontractors have worked with yeah. us for 20 years. The people the people that are on the sites have got mortgages to pay. It isn't faceless. And you don't know what you can do or what you can't do. So yeah. we, we, we set up these 7 o'clock meetings with a board where we just go, what can we get? What, what haven't we got? What's the feedback from yesterday? And try to keep the sites going. Yeah. Some people wanted the sites open, some people wanted shutting down. Most of our customers were supportive yeah. um, in terms of that. Um, and the good thing was then is you start to think about your no running the businesses. The most important thing is getting paid and getting your cash. cash. In. Yeah, yeah. Getting your cash. And mm -hmm. we've had some people that pay us late, but it doesn't matter because, you know, we, we, we we're a fairly cash risk business anyway. And um, then the way the the way that the group pulled together, we we, we decided we'd sell some assets, some land. Um, we didn't buy as much land as we wanted to, and our customers, some of our really good customers, started paying us on seven and fourteen days. And we went from a cash position of whatever it was, less than ten million, to having a positive thirty million pound cash position at the end of that year. And it just gave gave um, the ownership confidence and comfort that the business was secure and then it was like you know how do we say thank you to people and and and, and, and that kind of thing so it was a the challenge was more than more that you know we wasn't getting we know what we can do and we're a strong yeah. team and we can work together but when the landscape's changing and unclear all the time and the message was as garbled as it was, yeah, it was. that was where the stress came from. Because I think as a team, we can cope with anything. Yeah, I really I, do think you've got a good team. I, I'm the same kind of, I don't like the fact that our industry and uh, I say our industry, I mean recruitment really here, but 
put ourselves into a recession sometimes. And you hear all of these things in the papers and the press and all that sort of stuff. And I sort of think to myself, I'm not sure in my lifetime I'll go through the, the amount of uncertainty that COVID brought me. Um, uh, but when we look at the challenges coming, what 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 do you see as the challenges? Because I hear about inflationary cost prices, trying to trying to deliver jobs at prices that we agreed six months ago, and that the prices have changed. Buying land. What are you seeing as a leader at the moment as the big challenges in your world? I think all those things are, are real. You know. You've, you, you, you can't get materials, you can't get workforce. Um, it takes time um, and you have to have longer lead-ins and that kind of thing. Um, and getting things to start on site is difficult because of that, because you've agreed the contract, so it's been deferred for one reason or other, it hasn't got planning. Now it's gone back to board, you can go six months inflation. It, well, I've got to go back to board again. Don't go back to board because it'll go <laughs> yeah, up. Yeah. It'll go <laughs> up. Get, in, get into contract, get on site. Um, the, the big thing, really, I think, in all this is, is that at some point it will normalise. But who's going to be left? You know, this we've seen a graveyard of businesses yeah. through the last few years, the pandemic, um, all that kind of stuff. Um, who's going to be left? And can we work together differently at the end of it? Because I feel like, you know, the, where there's really? tensions, behaviours change, where there's stresses around budgets, behaviours change. How do we keep the relationships massively important to us? And then there's a bigger challenge to the industry around um, the Building Safety Act and things like that, where we've got to change the way that we work together. Design and build is not the future anymore. We need yeah. to be much more collaborative around complex and, and um, complex buildings and multi-residential builders have got to be much more collaborative in the way we approach and remove risk and make sure things are fully designed before they start. And that takes investment as well. I don't want to spend yeah, all my design fees up front because I'm not sure whether it's viable or not. Yeah. So I'll go to stage three and then we'll decide. Yeah. And we need to be we need to be contracting on stage five designs, not on stage three and stage four going forward. Yeah. And that'll be a challenge for us. But yeah. And I, I was thinking about this in Manchester. I'm in Manchester today, and, and I thought that the high-rise market had slowed down. I thought I thought there would be a slowdown in some of the things because, I mean, I've never seen a, a growth like it. But, you know, everyone I speak to at the moment says that planning is fundamentally broken in the UK. I mean, there's not a one person out there that doesn't think there needs to be some reform. One thing I don't get from a lot of people, though, is what would the solution look like? I mean, if we did solve the planning issues that we have in the country, what, what would that look like? Do you, have you got any thoughts on any of that sort of stuff from a planning perspective? I think, you know, there's lots of different ways you can reform planning and they take time and and, and, and you, you can work through them and, and then come up with them. The immediate thing they need is resources. Yeah, because it's, it's a resource-led issue right now. We keep on changing the system, but if there's a new system and still no people, then we, we've got to do that working from home and, um, you know, and people leaving the industry and people doing different things. We've got to get it fully resourced and, and functioning in the way that it's designed as a starter for town. That's, yeah, that's where we need to be, just getting a planning officer assigned and, you know, your stuff registered. It, it just doesn't if there was a service level agreement we'd be getting refunds wouldn't we we would and, and i think as well that the, the, the other thing that we struggle with is that housing if you look at that specifically becomes a political issue all the time and it's a political football and i don't want to get into politics but it needs to come out of that into infrastructure for me and it needs to start being the seed of something that we're not going to change every three to five years because we're getting to a point where every time there's a new government or a new leader, we, we sort of then change the goalposts on what's important again. Um, and like you said on the uh, building reform and, and and kind of all of these building safety bits that are coming out, I don't, if I was a housing association now, I'd, I wouldn't know where to spend my money. Or if I was a local authority, I wouldn't actually know where to put the investment. There's so much to do. Yeah, and, and with our political system, how do you get a 25-year plan when you've got a four or five-year term? It's almost impossible, isn't it? Yeah, no, it is. Um, so, so as we start wrapping up, what, one one thing that I, I, I didn't ask is, so sort of, you said you're a big reader. Do you read anything that 
that, that's helped you in your leadership journey? Or like, do you ever do any sort of self-development books? Was there anything that steered your career from that point of view? I, I think it, I've been really lucky where I've been. I've, I've always worked with really good people who've wanted to share the knowledge. I think that's the big thing is, I think the, the, the experience of being able to ask for counsel is good. Um, I think that's massive. I love podcasts as well. Um, the High Performance Podcast, and there's love lots it. of others out there. They're just brilliant. You put your headphones on, you go for it. That's what lockdown did. It made us all listen to podcasts. <laughs> Honestly, I did. <laughs> it's you put your headphones on and you go and you walk, and they've been good for sharing things. TED Talks are great. Yeah. Um, being members of professional bodies are great. Um, yeah, I, I do a lot of reading. And, and and the thing is, is not to take everything you've read in the book and try and apply it, or I've read a new book, so I've got a new initiative. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's it's, it's how you how you curb that because you can you can be bound in initiatives, can't you, really? Yeah, I know you can. And, and sometimes, yeah, you do come off these podcasts and think, right, I'm going to go and run away and do these three or four things. And actually, you get initiative fatigue, don't you? Just right, okay, I'm trying, trying to do too much here. Um, and, and as we wrap, wrap up, last couple of things is just what do you see the future of Seddon? Like, what do you see the next three to five years looking like for the business? What's the plan? Yeah, we you would when you when you're doing your business planning in construction. If you want a sustainable construction business, you're looking at education, healthcare, and housing, aren't you? As your three as your three pillars of your business plan. I think carbon is the thing now. I think that's gone. Carbon applies through everything. That, that's mm -hmm. the big thing. We've got to, we're building passive house for Salford Council. Um, we're building, we're building more sustainable new builds, but there's a massive building stock. And the issue is getting that all um looking for a decarbonization plan and also getting people out of fuel poverty and making businesses be able to afford the energy that it uses as well. So that's yeah. a massive thing for us. We're gonna we're, we're looking at our campus up at Bolton where we've got our offices and um, we've got where we keep our plant and equipment and that kind of thing and we'll we're going to be refurbishing that putting our money where our mouth is into making that more supportive for modern working but also yeah. how do we get net zero there so that that's we're going to put our money where our mouth is on that and that's the services we're going to be doing take taking forward with customers and really for me it's growing it's growing the the, um, the the smaller divisions where it's lower risk so the painting company could become national if it wanted to the um the prop services where they're doing maintenance and they're providing a really good service in in, yeah. in, a, in a low value marketplace that can grow housing is never going to go away um so you know we can grow parts of the business quite nicely with the, just with the customers we've got as well because we've got some we've got a really good customer base yeah. and and, and strong pipeline with them, which is really important. We're doing a lot more work with fewer people because we understand each other better. Always the way. And also, I suppose, that the way you've set the group up as a business at Seddon is you have got a bit of less pressure in the sense that sort of that some of them markets will get busier if the market downturns and some will get quieter. And, and you can sort of be benchmark them against each other slightly, can't you, a little bit, whereas... If you're in one market, it can be quite volatile at times, can't it? You've got that stability across the group, haven't you? Really, it's been great. It's been great for the private house builder. Said Gnomes has been great for the last couple yeah. of years, um, and it's all cycles, isn't it? it you know, it, it all comes. Things turn up, things turn down. So yeah, we've got. A, it's like a little bit like your pension portfolio, isn't it? We've got a balanced portfolio that should see us through yeah. all different types of financial cycles. Yeah, no, definitely. Well, I think that's a nice way to wrap up. And uh, I just wanted to say thank you for coming on. Uh, it's been really good to get an insight into you as a person, but also kind of the Seddon journey is fascinating. And, and I look forward to tracking it over the next 10, 15 years. If people do want to reach out to you, where's the best place? Can they send you a message on LinkedIn? Sometimes people just want, like, they'll listen to something and think, I just want to ask a question. Are you happy for that? LinkedIn's great. Yeah, definitely. Perfect. All right, I'll get them to reach out. Thank you for putting on the podcast. Thanks, James.